Thank you, everyone. So uh, I'm very glad to be here to give a talk on the impact on the uh, data and AI strategies. So I think over the past two years, we have seen the gene AI growth uh, incredibly, incredibly speed. Uh, as we know, OpenAI has released uh, several versions of these uh, top models. And uh, even in the open source uh, world, there are more than 70,000 Lama-based variants and also 50,000 uh, Cuban-based uh, uh, models have been released. And even in China, there is a so-called hundred model world happening. And, and also, the, it's not just the large language models, but we're also seeing the whole ecosystem is growing, include the tech stacks, the uh, AI application architecture patterns, and also we can see the changes in the data space as well. These changes are pushing the companies to, to try out the, and to adopt this new technology. Uh, but we also notice that not all organizations at the same page, uh, at the same stage when it comes to using the gen generative AI. Uh, some are jumping in the both feed and all, while others are still figuring out how to start. I think these gaps uh, often comes from a lack of uh, the capabilities. Uh, some companies may uh, claim that they are uh, not data ready for building the AI applications. And also there are a lot of complexities of uh, the inf infrastructures. And also even some company concerned about that the tech is moving so fast so that they, what they invest, they might be out, outdated very soon. So uh, they are very, uh, concerned about the investing. You might wonder if everyone is experimenting the similar uh, business scenarios and using the similar models, uh, what, what is uh, the op 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 adoption level is different from the company to companies? And what is the key successful AI adoption uh, factors? I think the answer in these questions, I have found that the major difference is uh, between the companies in how they leverage their data and AI uh, foundations. And this includes how well they prepare their data for the business use cases, especially when they adopting the AI, new generative AI applications. So how well you pre prepare the data. And also how effectively they combine the existing data uh, with the new data sources and how willing they are to transform their current data infrastructures and management practices. There are two driving forces uh, led the companies to rethink their data, data and AI foundations. So I think in, in one hand, uh, because uh, business has already tried a lot of uh, uh, POCs, there's a, a, already some tangible business values and, and business have their chance to unlock some new opportunities and also uh, in gener gene generative AI and also they have some clear and measurable results uh, they can see. And also this drive uh, the need of uh, the data and AI platforms uh, to evolve to better support the business needs. And on the other hand, I think generative AI uh, technology itself can be uh, transformed the data and AI platforms as well. Uh, th this is from the type of the data to be uh, processed and to be stored and, uh, and, and uh, as well as how effectively to build in the AI models. Uh, I think under the influence of these two forces, uh, I believe there are three key changes uh, should be focused on uh, when building the new adaptive data and AI strategy. I think the first one is how to unlock the unstructured data uh, and transform it to a valuable enterprise knowledge base. And the second is uh, how to <coughs> leverage the natural language interaction experience brought by GNI to drive the self-service analytics and the following data platform transformation. Uh, and also the third one is about how gen generative AI can more comprehensively promote the adoption of the implementation of all all AI technology, not just the generative AI. Okay, 
Uh, let's deep dive into the each impacts in details. I, I think the first one is uh, to unlock the the unstructured data. Uh, according to the Huawei's uh, global industry vision report, uh, global data volume is uh, projected to be reach uh, 180 zettabits by 2025, and over uh, 80 of 80 percent of the data is uh, unstructured data. I think uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Go mentioned this in the keynote as well. So. Uh, Astra data became more and more important in the enterprise. And also, but there are not too much co companies and the <coughs> industry, uh, are not too much companies and enterprise, they are start to using the uh, unstructured data. And in the report, they mentioned estimated that only 25% of the unstructured data being used in production. But we are seeing uh, this affects uh, uh, from many of our clients in different uh, industries. So whether that is in finance, uh, banking, energy, or manufacturing, they all have a lot of uh, unstructured data, but haven't been used uh, very uh, uh, frequently. But probably you ask one question: Why enterprise was not using the uh, unstructured data? What is the primary reason? Is uh, not processing that before the generative AI. Yeah, I think uh, unlike the structured data, so uh, which fits <coughs> fits neatly into the rows and the columns, uh, like the in the database, unstructured data lacks of uh, the predefined format. So in document, we for for instance, we might see uh, a lot of embedded tables, images, and stamps or handwritten content. Processing this. Diver, uh, diverse range of data types require of different tools. Uh, so, for example, if we want to extract data from the uh, document, we need to using the NER, and we need to using the summarization models as well. But building this uh, data, uh, unstructured data processing workflow is uh, pretty complex. So moreover, the engineering capabilities needed to processing these documents uh, differ from those used for the structured data. So when we're uh, processing the structured data, we are us usually to building the data models, building the data pipelines, building the data warehouse. What we do is we're using the uh, query language, or we are, uh, you write the script to processing the data. But when processing the uh, unstructured data, like the document, we are working involve a lot of uh, AI and machine learning capabilities, uh, which make it more and uh, more uh, AI engineering task uh, and not a uh, data engineering task. I think this is the main reason why processing the unstructured data is really hard in before the generative AI. And when it comes to generative AI, I think there is a, a lot of uh, Improvement. So, for example, the accuracy. Uh, I think the large language model has uh, reached and outperformed the uh, LP most of the LP tasks uh, than before, and also the, that created the uh, chances to simplify the whole workflows. Previously, we need to have uh, different models to recognize the image in the document. We need to recognize the layout in the document, but currently. With the capabilities by the large language model, you can process that in the same time. So I think this is a big shift uh, by introduce the GNI in the unstructured data processing. And also, there's a lot of uh, uh, advancement on the how to tra translate and how to convert the unstructured data into the enterprise knowledge. So. I think the knowledge base currently is uh, start to be became the default uh, practices uh, to building the REG uh, uh, AI applications, and also uh, there's a, another new innovative approach to gain the uh, knowledge from the the raw text is to building the knowledge graph, and when building the knowledge graph, you don't need to have too many manual work. Currently, so the large language model plays two roles. 
when it's constructing the uh, the extracting the entity and the relationships for you. And another another role is playing by large language model is helping you to translate the business queries uh, into the uh, like for example the cipher queries. So that is a. Uh, the advantage uh, and benefits bring by the uh, generative AI. However, I think when the enterprise trying to implement the, this knowledge base or knowledge graph, they have some uh, uh, key question will arise. Uh, should they start from the building one single use case or they need to consider in future scenarios for the share usage? This is especially critical when the volume and the scale of the document exceeds the, exceed their POC levels. Uh, in such case, I think organizations uh, must address some inter enterprise level concerns, uh, such as uh, the, how to grant the permissions, how to manage the access, how to make sure the knowledge base or knowledge graph is reliable, and how to make them uh, availability, how to increase the availabilities. So as a result, building the knowledge base is not as straightforward as it seems to be. And it requires a lot of uh, careful planning and consideration to ensure the knowledge can be effectively utilized across multiple scenarios while maintaining the necessary security and integrities. So recently, uh, we have encountered two different scenarios. So in one retail companies, they need to build in uh, 15 GNI use cases and aim to building a shared knowledge base. So they can reduce the architecture complexities, complexities and also uh, trying to improve their usage. Uh, and in another hand, we have another client, client trying to build in a um, knowledge base based on the two, more than 2,000 documents they're trying to create a 20 knowledge base to support their business needs. I think this kind of uh, give us a, a chance to looking at this uh, enterprise knowledge base building. We can see that the challenge faced in the realm, realm of the structured data also comes into the unstructured data areas. So I think the, the question remains, should we adopt a centralized approach to building the knowledge graph, to building the knowledge base, or should we just uh, try to using the data as a product approach? So this is a kind of uh, uh, urgent issues when the enterprise trying to uh, scale their uh, knowledge base and scale their usage of the unstructured data. So I think in summary, the importance of the unstructured data is uh, undeniable. And we, as we leverage it effectively, we must continually explore the practical ways to implement it. So not just to follow the POC experience to see how to build in this knowledge base, or expecting that it can be scaled to the large group. So another big shift and an impact I'm going to talk is about the GNI kind of uh, promotes the self-service analytics. Um, so I think companies strive many years to uh, promoting the self-service analytics, but the progress uh, has been very slow. So when they setting up the BI tools, they are expecting that is the self self-service analytics for the business, and then the desire is to empower the business team and and to understanding the and improve their data literacies within the organizations, but the, some uh, some expectation hasn't been reached. The data team still be the bottleneck to derive the data values, and the, the routine data issues faced by the business remain unresolved and resolve and remain unresolved. So I think there are several challenges hinder the realization of the self-service analytics in enterprise. I think the first one is um, probably the data literacy. Uh, this lack, lack is not only for the uh, business people, but also for the uh, data people as well. So the issue affects both teams and each side has its own shortcomings in understanding 
and utilize the data efficiently. And also there are difficulties with uh, the business people trying to write the SQLs to have these analytical skills. So that also stopped the business people to building this kind of self-service analytics capabilities. And also I think a very critical reason for uh, not moving the self-service analytics forward is uh, in the enterprise, this, there's a lot of uh, data is very hard to, to understand and there's no enough or accurate or enhanced metadata to explain uh, what is the data field means and how to use it. And uh, when you're building the metrics based on that data fields, what you should care about, what is the different calibrations by different peoples. So that all the uh, uh, leads to the issue of the enterprise is very hard to adopt this self, self uh, service analytics. But I think with GNI, uh, enterprise are starting to develop in the, this uh, self-service uh, capabilities by this natural language interface. So this natural language interface allows users to access uh, various data sources, uh, such as the data house, uh, the lake house, uh, and also the knowledge base, knowledge graph we mentioned earlier. And this interface aim to simplify the way the users to use uh, with a complex data sets by enabling them to ask questions in the, their everyday language. Uh, the promise of the natural language analysis is to empower the business users to explore and analysis on the data independently without needing the assistance from the data and data engineers and also the data analysts. So I think by making the data more accessible, business users can uh, more easily uncover the value of the insights. So navigate the uh, navigate from the uh, complex data sets. However, there's a potential e potential issues. Uh, the journey toward to fully realizing the natural language analytics is still involving uh, challenges like uh, accurate. Uh, actually interpreting the business specific queries and in understanding the context to building the queries and to derive the actionable insights. This challenge is still remain. Uh, so as an enterprise continue to invest in refine this technology, I think um, there is still a way to make it better. And currently, most of the natural language interface is rely on this text to SQL te techniques. So, which essentially the inter uh, the text to SQL <coughs> act as a translators. It's converting the business questions to into the SQL queries. Uh, will this approach works? Uh, the accuracy uh, is still far from the reaching the human level of performance. Uh, I think the, the SOTA uh, solutions, the state-of-the-art solutions on the leaderboard uh, achieve only 60 to 70 accuracies on the evaluation basis. And it's, uh, this accuracy tends to drop further when applied into the enterprise uh, context. And also, I think there are two key main reasons behind this. And the first one is the complexity of the enterprise context. Uh, because when business queries often have some implicit meanings, uh, including the industry specific or co company specific jargons, uh, and also require some uh, background knowledge. So the context in which this question are asked can be highly complex. Uh, making it very difficult for the CQ to uh, test the CQ models to interpret correctly. Um, and the second reason I think is uh, the lack of the uh, reasoning capabilities uh, by the in the large language model. As we know, currently uh, the large language model is kind of a compress of the world knowledge. So it doesn't perform very well in the reasoning tasks, but the, I think the listen, listen, uh, latest uh, open AI model uh, strawberry uh, start to uh, step into another area of the large language model, which is uh, 
the large reasoning reasoner models, which may help. But currently, the the issue is still there. The the reasoning capability is still not that good. I think to address these uh, limitations, uh, no matter that is the current model or the complexity of the context, uh, we need to think about how to simplify these complexities by promoting uh, and promoting the effective learning. Just as we optimize the human learning by managing the cognitive load, so uh, we can uh, minimize the unnecessary uh, distractions, uh, we'll focus on the most relevant information and put that into the large language model and hoping the large language model can uh, follow that principles and uh, can be using that limit information and relevant information to perform better than the, the pure uh, test to SQL technology. Uh, since most uh, enterprise won't train the model from the scratch, so uh, probably uh, trying to build in this domain specific language, we can do in the fine tune and trying to uh, improve, the, improve the model uh, capabilities. And, and one key action is making is to uh, how to in uh, how to make the data to be more self-descriptive by enhancing the uh, metadata management, uh, which is uh, uh, in the left uh, right hand side. So, which is uh, how to manage the intrinsic load uh, for for people. Uh, just uh, uh, take the example. Uh, and also, I think another practice probably can uh, apply is to building this. Uh, on providing the only the the metrics that being uh, clearly defined by and direct relevant to the business challenges, so this connect to the role of the uh, data platform, especially the semantic layer. I think uh, recent two years uh, this practice has been adopted by more and more companies and uh, enterprise uh, because of uh, they met the same issues. The, the most uh, challenge issues of, with the business users is they asking uh, for why this, this data is uh, uh, transforming or calculate in this way. So, and uh, they are trying to uh, very hard to explain and uh, really to come out as a result. So I think by uh, simplifying the complexity of the, uh, this workflow and and uh, we adding some, uh, we limit some uh, data input for the large language model and uh, for or for the text to SQL models. So we got a chance to make it happen to uh, promote the uh, natural language analytics capability forward. So that make it make the self analytics uh, uh, one step forward in the enterprise. So if we considering these changes needed in the data platform, so to enable this uh, natural language interface for self-service data analytics, I think there are two key transformation uh, should be take place. Uh, first, uh, we need to strengthen the data governance and metadata management, uh, just as I explained. So large language, large language model is, has problem to uh, process a lot of uh, the extra information. So we need to let the data to be self-described. De and, and this is isn't just about uh, ensuring the high quality of data, but also about providing the explainability of the data fields for the large language model. And, be, and also the business user can easily understand. And second is building these semantic layers. Uh, the odd, this is what we call that matrix layers. Uh, this layer would define the, and align the business metrics and allowing the large language model to map business questions to specific metrics. So that also means for large language model, they don't need to use in their reasoning capabilities uh, to figure out how to write the SQL. The semantic layer would then generate the 
SQL queries and to retrieve the data from the warehouse, from the lake house. I think this approach ensures more accurate results and provide traceable logging of the processing happening behind the scenes. And also this is uh, our practice in different companies already. So by providing these two layers uh, and um, an enhancement that will improve the self-service analytics capability a lot. And the last but not the least impact in generative AI uh, is actually accelerated the broader AI adoptions. I think one of the biggest challenge uh, enterprise have faced is in building the AI applications is lack of the data. So da the data here, I mean, is uh, the high quality data and trainable data. So which is a, a, a big problem for company for many years. So when business identify the, their problems and trying to solve the problems by using AI, they usually stop there because they are lack of this trainable data. So however, I think when Gen AI comes, we are now seeing a growing trend that companies are overcoming these barriers by using the generative AI to generate the synthetic data. Uh, whether it is uh, tackling the co-star problem in building the recommendation engine, or they are trained some uh, uh, visual models to identify the product uh, categories, or uh, 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 segmenting the users in the marketing scenarios, uh, the business can also leverage this GNI and all the multi-model, uh, multi-modality models to, uh, to build in the synthetic data. And this driving forward the development of the machine learning models. Uh, what's more, I think the resources and the, the powers, uh, the efforts is being needed is less than the previously. And also, uh, once these issues of the initial training data is resolved, it becomes um, much easier for building this whole uh, data loops. And we can start to using this data in production and training the next inter, inter uh, read models and create this uh, real data uh, feedback loop. Uh, in the in in this way, I think GNI is helping the companies to start to rotate this uh, data flywheel and uh, to helping to building not only the traditional. Uh, not, not only the generative AI applications, but also the traditional AI applications. And also, I see, I, I, I see in the industry, there is a synergy of the AI technologies and they are using this uh, comprehensive, comprehensive AI te technology for, uh, for the optimal results. So I think uh, the, the after the industry uh, has more AI maturities through the implementation of the diverse AI use cases, so they are discovering the advantage of the, the best of the both worlds approach, which is uh, combining the different AI te technologies to address the complex uh, and nat complex nature real world problems uh, with this uh, great efficiencies. So in this concept, uh, the Berkeley has a paper called that compound AI systems. And in Ghana, they call that uh, co composite AI, uh, which centers on blending these various uh, AI uh, technolo technologies to tackle the challenges. Uh, initially, the introdu introduction of the large language model led many organizations to adopt the foundation model approach to solve a, a wide range of the challenges. So the, the company and enterprise start to thinking, I don't need to build in the uh, task specific models. I just uh, can leverage the large language model or foundation models to build in my AI applications. But however, the paradigm has a shift back to more thoughtful and mature strategy, where it's combining this multiple AI technology and provide providing the more smarter and uh, more effective parts forward. 
And also with the rest of the diverse use cases, uh, uh, we can see the evolution of uh, AI platform is accelerating. Uh, when building the traditional AI uh, machine learning platforms, we typically covers uh, data preparations, uh, actually mainly it's about the data labeling. We, the AI platforms will include in the model selection components and the focus on how to build in the uh, models and how to evaluate in the models, etc. However, the JI brings the new demands that may exist in the AI may not exist in the current AI platforms, such as the capabilities to host the large language models. So the infrastructure is different. They need uh, the uh, uh, extensive uh, computer resource. And also, the, in the original AI platforms, there's no feature to fine tuning the models. And crit uh, very critically, so there's no guardrails, no uh, monitoring for the large language models or for their AI applications. So this is uh, all new changes for the AI platforms. I think this all driving the platforms to add in some functionalities progressively, pro progr uh, uh, progressively. And also at the same time, I think the, the focus of the machine learning ops and also is shifting towards to the large language ops, LLM ops, to meet these unique requirements. Uh, well, M ops is more focused on how to automate and streamline this model end-to-end -end model uh, buildings and large longer uh, model operations. LLM operations is specializing managing the specific challenges in large longer model, including how to customize the large longer model, how to making it secure, and how to improve the performance of the uh, large longer model. So considering all these uh, significant changes and shifts, so I think a well-defined data and AI strategy will pave the way for a more integrated platforms. So uh, this approach will not only enhance collaborations between uh, different AI technologies, but also ensure the platform can effectively support diverse use cases. So I think by allowing the data governance, uh, metadata management, and also the model management uh, practices, uh, organizations can create a robust framework that foster the innovations and optimize their resource allocations. And ultimately, this integrated strategy will empower the business to leverage AI for potential, uh, driving better insights and more effective decision makings. So in the end, I'd like to reference a call from uh, Roy Amara. Uh, we tend to overestimate the effect of our technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Uh, this serves as a reminder to remain optimistic about the future impact of the generative AI. Well, challenges may still exist that hinders most AI adoptions, but I think the long-term benefits and transformative potential of this technology are worth looking forward to. And by focusing on the overcoming these challenges, uh, we can pave the way for the future where AI enhance our capability and driving the meaningful progress across uh, various industries. So uh, thanks all, that's my talk for today. Thank you.